Hi, this is Rod Young here, South Waikato, New Zealand. Uh, just giving a uh, video on the maths behind how to represent COVID. Hey, this is Henry, and you probably won't be surprised to hear that I've recently been thinking a bit more about epidemiology than physics. When I see daily news reports on COVID-19, it's really difficult for me to build a coherent picture of what's actually going on because the numbers are changing so quickly, which is exactly what you'd expect with exponential growth, that they're almost immediately out of date. We know that epidemics tend to grow exponentially at first, and also that exponential growth is really, really hard for our human brains to understand because of just how crazily fast it is. My friend Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown has a great overview video about exponential growth, which I highly recommend. But regarding the news, I'd rather know where we're headed and if we're making detectable progress. Are we winning or losing? Because, of course, we can't have exponential growth forever. At some point, the disease will run out of new people to infect, either because most people have already been infected, or because we as society manage to get it under control. But, and this is the scary part to me, when you're in the middle of an exponential, it's essentially impossible to tell when it's going to end. Are we in for 10 times as many cases as we currently have? Or 100 times as many? Or 1,000? Exactly when exponential growth ends is important, because it hugely determines how many people fall ill, yet so little reporting actually focuses at all on how to tell if exponential growth is ending. After talking about this with my friend Atish, he put together a new graph visualizing the COVID-19 epidemic on a global scale. This graph uses the real data and shows all countries traveling along the trajectory of exponential growth, and it makes it super obvious which ones have managed to stop the exponential spread of disease. They plummet downwards off the main sequence in a way I find super compelling. And this figure also makes it abundantly clear that even if a country doesn't have lots of cases right now, COVID-19 is probably going to follow the same trajectory there and end up spreading and spreading and spreading. Uh so this graph here shows you um, all of the new countries that are getting their first case and then coming online. And so this is a huge amount. And these ones that pop down, uh, like China and um, uh, Korea and Japan, uh, show that they've got a way of um, actually coping with it within their countries and all these other countries that are heading up up this way um, they're still trying to come to grips with it until that country hits the emergency eject button if you're planning for the future and your country doesn't have a lot of cases yet it's nevertheless a safe bet that you're probably headed down a similar path so how did we make this graph well there are three key ideas the first is to plot on a logarithmic scale since that's the natural scale for exponential growth note that the tick marks grow by multiples of 10 so 10 100 1000 rather than 10, 20, 30. This scales up small numbers and scales down large numbers, making the growth equally apparent on all scales, and lets us compare the growth in countries with very different numbers of cases. Which brings us to the second idea, catch changes early by looking at change itself. For example, if you look at the growth of cases in South Korea, you can see that at first they're exponential, and later the growth slows down. But when you're halfway up this curve, it's hard to tell by eye that it is slowing down. It kind of still looks exponential. If instead you chart the number of new cases in the last week, in other words, the rate of growth, it's much easier to see that the growth is indeed starting to slow down. And when the number of new cases each week flattens out or goes down, you've escaped the scary exponential growth zone. The third idea behind our graph is one from physics. Don't plot against time. Usually, when you see exponential growth, the number of cases is plotted versus time. But the spread of the disease doesn't care if it's March or April. It only cares about two things, how many cases there are today, and how many new cases there will be today. That is, the total number of infections and the growth rate of infections. The defining feature of exponential growth is that the number of new cases is proportional to the number of existing cases, which means that if you plot new cases versus total cases, exponential growth appears as a straight line. Um, that's where they get the... Um, the um, R naught figure, so three, they basically said um, a person that gets, on average, a person who gets COVID passes on to three other people, and those three people pass it on three, and there's nine, then 27. So these are what we plotted on our graph. The number of new cases, aka the growth rate, is on the y-axis, and the cumulative number of cases is on the x-axis, both on logarithmic scales. This gives us a beautiful, horrible graph that shows where all countries are in their COVID-19 journeys. It makes it obvious that the disease is spreading in the same manner everywhere. We're all headed on the same trajectory, just shifted in time. And it makes it obvious where public health measures like testing, isolation, physical distancing, and contact tracing have started to beat back the disease, and where they either aren't working or haven't had time to show up in the data. And it's interesting that each one of these, uh, each one of these countries, uh, it doesn't matter the population size, if they're big or small, what this does is it shows them on that, that curve because it's the relative nature.
In nearly every country so far, the number of cases grows at basically the same rate, until it doesn't. And that's what I feel like is missing from so much COVID-19 coverage, a sense of whether or not we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and that's one of the things why, for example, here in South Waikato, one of 10 districts, if you like, around Waikato University. So each of the students would come and listen to the council and the mayor and then their the policies, uh, and then they would go back to the university uh, and write up a newsletter that goes out weekly to all the people in the region uh, so we know what's happening. And it's having scientists and young people that are schooled and educated at the at the actual council meetings to actually hold to account what's currently going on. And this is where our media, they don't have the ability to do science science, maths, biology, physics, chemistry. Are we still on the rocket ship of contagion, like the US? Or have we managed to hit the emergency eject button, like China? And this graph shows us that. It gives us some sense of what's actually happening in these uncertain times. That said, this graph also has a number of caveats and limitations. Its main goal is to emphasize deviations from exponential growth, that is, to amplify the light at the end of the tunnel, so it may be less informative for other purposes. So here are the caveats. 10,000 looks really close to 1,000 on a log scale. This kind of distortion might allow people to take COVID-19 less seriously. Also, the log scale on the x-axis makes it harder to see a resurgence of new infections after a significant downturn. A plot with a linear x-axis is better for that. Unlike most other COVID-19 graphs you've probably seen, time isn't on the x-axis, which might be confusing. Instead, time is shown through an animation. Another important caveat is that this graph, and basically every other COVID-19 graph you've seen, isn't actually showing the true number of cases, just the number of detected cases. The true number of cases is unknown, but certainly much higher than the number detected. In reality, COVID-19 cases spread at a slower rate than what this data implies. It's kind of a subtle idea, but this data reflects not just increases in case numbers, but also increases in the number of tests performed. And since we're ramping up tests, it makes it look like the cases are growing faster than they actually are, but they're still growing. And that's a good point. That's where the United States is at the moment, and it's more testing. Same in New Zealand, we're testing, and so that's why the numbers seem to be going up. The data we're using is incomplete, as it relies on daily reports from overburdened healthcare systems around the world. Also, different countries have dramatic differences in the resources that are available and dedicated for testing. Finally, the trends in this plot are delayed a few days, since we're plotting the average growth rate over the last week. There's just too much variability in the data to plot daily growth rates. This is actually kind of a good thing. It means it's a pessimistic graph. It doesn't get too excited too soon, and so a downward trend on the graph is much more likely to be a real downward trend. And a real downward trend is what we want, for all countries. A lot of daily news just reports recent data points. Yet to understand where we're headed, it's not enough to know just where we are today. We need to be talking about trends. How many new cases are there today, relative to the number of new cases yesterday, or last week? Charting the rate of change empowers us all to more clearly see what the future holds. A giant thanks to Atish Bhatia, who created the interactive visualization and helped write this script. Atish's work on this has been a beacon to me in these hard times. And this video was made possible by Brilliant.org. So I just thank that gentleman for putting this together. So one of the things that's going to probably come out of this virus is the, the scientific and maths. Uh, for example, this video here is exciting to be able to share with you some of the cutting edge uh, uses. And this is everyday stuff we do in the physics lab as a scientist. Uh, and, and it's applying it to a real life situation. We're all locked down. We're all looking out there wondering what's going on. And so little gems of ideas are coming up and being explained in ways which we'll never forget uh, and the internet is incredible this is the new classroom the bricks and mortar have gone and now we've got this digital so we're actually getting some amazing teachers coming out amazing uh, educators uh, using the digital technology and coming to the forefront while we're all locked down and so we'll never ever go back from this it's a ratcheting up it's like the handbrake you push the button in to let it back down again but it's click 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 Okay, Rod Young out, South Waikato, New Zealand.